Hello again. It's March 19th, 2020, and I'm recording the Week 9 Tram Road Lab for the Stephen F. Austin State University Dendrology Lab. I'm Dr. Jeremy Stovall, Professor of Silviculture, and we'll be missing this lab as well this semester due to the coronavirus outbreak. In Lab 9 at Tram Road, we end up looking at some of our wettest sighted species. So these are all mesic to hydric in this site preference. And so when you look at this list of a dozen species, many of them are going to be trees, water locust, water hickory, parsley hawthorn, hawthorn, eastern cottonwood, black willow, sweet leaf, and cedar elm. Um, some of those are small trees like sweet leaf and the hawthorns. Trifoliate orange is an invasive sprawling shrub. And when we look at some of the other species on here, like dwarf palmetto and giant cane, they're actually monocots. Most of what we're learning this semester is a dicot. Those are actually monocots, so they'll be smaller in stature, where dwarf palmetto is a small palm and giant cane is a large grass. Uh, the final species on there is American buckwheat vine, and it is the only vine we'll be learning on this week nine list. So let's get to it. Our first species is Ericaceae, Sable, Minor, the Dwarf Palmetto. Minor means small, and basically Dwarf Palmetto is a small palm tree. Uh, it's small enough to the point that you rarely see a trunk. It mostly appears to be large, fan palm-like leaves emerging from the ground. Dwarf Palmetto is native from Oklahoma and East Texas, east to Florida up to North Carolina. So it's a southern coastal plain species. When we look at the leaves of dwarf palmetto, again, it is a fan palm. So these leaves can be one to five or almost six feet in total length. Uh, think of it as a compound leaf where the petiole emerges from the ground and then there is a palmately compound leaf at the top. Again, this is a monocot, as I mentioned a moment ago, unlike a dicot. And one characteristic of many monocots is long strap-like leaves that you see here. In terms of the form, it can reach about six feet tall. It can reach about six feet wide. And so this would be what you're looking for in a typical area where there's a lot of dwarf palmetto. Fruits are sometimes distinct on it. They'll be on stalks that can also be about six feet long. Here they are as a cluster of blackish droops. And here's a close-up of one or two of them that haven't quite ripened yet. You can see they're still a little bit green. So when we look at dwarf palmetto, it's native, it's common, it can provide some cover and soft mast for wildlife, and it should be pretty darned easy to identify. There is one common mistake I see on it. People will mix this up for our Louisiana yucca, one of our native yuccas. But there's a couple key diagnostic features that help you tell the two apart. One is sight. As you see in this photo here, dwarf palmetto is a very mesic sighted species. It likes wet, rich soils. Yuccas are generally xeric sighted species, so you find them on drier, typically more sandy soils. So the sites are pretty much complete opposites. The second is that leaf form low. People mistake these because they're both monocots, they both have strap-like leaves, but with Louisiana yucca, you have individual strap-like leaves emerging from a basal rosette on a dry site. With dwarf palmetto, again, you have these fan palm, palmately compound leaves emerging from the base on a mesic site. Water locust is a medium-sized native tree occurring on some of our wettest sites in the U.S. South. Uh, it reaches about 36 feet in total height and can form thickets in some really wet areas, areas where in the winter you'd be wading chest or even deeper in water. Scientific name on water locust is Fabaceae gladitsia aquatica. It is a lagoon, and it looks extraordinarily similar to our honey locust, which is Fabaceae gladitsia triacanthos. In terms of the leaves, they're either bipinnate or pinnately compound. It varies even all on the same tree. And these leaflets will be smaller. Generally, they're less than an inch in length, which helps you distinguish it from our black locust. The leaves are relatively sparse, uh, and the leaflets are relatively small. So you can see a number of them here on a branch. But when you look further away at the crown, 
This gives Water Locust a very open-looking crown, where you're always going to get a lot of light coming through the crown, even in the middle of summer. Now, Water Locust and our native Honey Locust are extraordinarily difficult to tell apart. Usually, the only way you're telling them apart is the site. So, Honey Locust is an intermediate to even somewhat xeric sighted species, whereas Water Locust, Aquatica's right in the name, it's a hydric sighted species. The only morphological difference between the two species, if you want to tell them apart if it's been planted or something like that, is the legume, the fruit. And so, if you'll remember back to honey locust, its legumes were six to eight inches long, they curved like a banana, or they were even helical, like a spiral staircase. By contrast, the fruits on water locust are one or two inches long, and they're shaped like a lung. If you had two of these together, flipped backwards, it would look like a pair of lungs. There's no way you can't tell these fruit apart. Water locust has one or two seeds, maybe three in the legume, whereas you're going to have dozens potentially in honey locust. Now the notable feature on these is going to be the thorns. They have nasty branching thorns all over them. Uh, if you're a duck hunter, you've probably run afoul of these at some point or another. Uh, you really got to watch out for these, putting holes in waders, anything else you have out on one of these hydric sites. So here you see more examples of the thorns, but I also want to draw your attention to the bark on this larger tree. Uh, the bark has kind of like a gray, slightly purplish look to it, generally smooth textured. Here's a close-up of the thorns. When they're fresh, they've just formed, they will be reddish. And because thorns are modified twigs, they can branch off of one another. So water locust is common, it's native, it doesn't get large enough or have good enough form typically to have any timber value. It is a legume, so it's going to provide wildlife value for a diversity of species. People do plant honey locust in urban landscapes. We have some cultivars that are bred to be thornless. You wouldn't want one of these trees with all these thorns on it planted in your yard or on a city street. Uh, I'm not aware of as much use of water locust in that same context. So. We're primarily just looking at a native species in our southern bottomland forests. The range is a little interesting on water locust. It'll range in East Texas, on up the lower Mississippi alluvial valley as far north as Illinois, and then it has some disjunct other populations in North Florida, uh, East Georgia, and southwestern South Carolina. So kind of a, a split up range map. This isn't widespread across the entire south. Water hickory is a native hydric sited bottomland hardwood species in the southern U.S. It ranges from East Texas along the lower coastal plain over to Florida as far north as almost Virginia um, and it'll range up the lower Mississippi alluvial valley to Missouri. It also goes by the name bitter pecan and its scientific name is Juglandaceae caria aquatica. It is our wettest sighted hickory. Now the common name bitter pecan derives from the fact that this tree looks very similar to pecan. It is in the pecan hickory group, meaning it has more leaflets than the true hickories. Uh, as you see here, it'll commonly have 11, 13 leaflets. All the leaflets are about the same size. You don't have the terminal leaflets being larger than the other leaflets, and they're all generally curved. So these leaves are almost indistinguishable from pecan leaves. Here you see another example here. It is very easy to tell apart from shagbark hickory, mockernut hickory, and the other true hickories, however. If you do want to tell a bitter pecan or water hickory apart from a sweet pecan or pecan, which of course is Caria illinoinensis, the best way to do it is to look at the fruit. And so here you see some of the nuts uh, not quite ripe yet on a water hickory, but what you're really looking for is shown well here. Along one axis, they'll be squashed flat, kind of like a hamburger patty. You can contrast that with pecan, which has a longer tubular nut, which may remind you more of a hot dog. So the differences in the shape of the nut is a very good identification feature. Uh, on the bark, it's standard hickory bark. It's going to have that anastomosing pattern where you have the interlacing diamond-shaped ridges that become more prominent as the tree gets older. 
You will see here, sometimes it can confuse you in the bark a little bit for shag bark hickory. The bark can peel vertically in strips sometimes, similar to shag bark. But again, shag bark will typically have five leaflets, and water hickory is typically going to have 11, 13, even more. The twigs are also going to be a helpful identification feature. They will have tomentum on them like mockernut, but again, you're not going to confuse it with mockernut with all those leaflets. And the other difference is the terminal bud here is naked. It doesn't have bud scales on it like the true hickories do. Here's another example of a couple buds, and you can really see those naked terminal buds do make this easily distinguishable from other hickories it may be similar to. Now, water hickory or bitter pecan, as the name implies, the, the nuts aren't as sweet as Caria illinoinensis or pecan. And so they are eaten by wildlife, but they're preferred to a lesser extent than many of the other hickories. Uh, you'll have squirrels, feral hogs, other taxa eating them. This is a smaller tree than many of the other hickories. It grows slowly because it's on these really heavily flooded hydric sites uh, with heavy clay soils. Uh, so mostly it's just a native component of many of these ecosystems. Uh, it really doesn't have much timber value. It tends to get shake where when you saw boards out of it, they'll kind of fall apart. Um, and so it doesn't have nearly the timber value that you see out of pecan or some of the other hickories. Uh, that being said, it is used for firewood. It's good for smoking barbecue, just like all the other hickories, uh, and it is a common native species. Hey there, folks. Today we're going to be woodworking. But first, we have to put on all this fine PPE. We'll start with boots, a shirt, Giant cane is the only grass we'll be learning this semester. Uh, some of the grasses, like bamboos, can become woody, which is why we're including it. It's in the grass family, the Poaceae, and its scientific name is Arundinaria gigantea. Giant cane is native from East Texas on up to Missouri, east to the Atlantic Ocean, and in the east, it even ranges as far north as southern New York. Uh, it's believed that prior to European settlement, there were hundreds of thousands of acres of cane-dominated ecosystems that we called cane breaks. Uh, however, these were fire-dependent ecosystems, and with the arrival of European settlers, fire began being removed from these ecosystems, uh, livestock were brought in, there was overgrazing, and so now it's believed we only have about 2% of the original acreage in this cane break ecosystem that we once had. That being said, giant cane is here as a species. It's not threatened or anything like that because it's shade tolerant. It can hang out in the understory. We've just lost much of this unique uh, early successional community. Giant cane reef sprouts uh, from rhizomes, and so it handles flooding very well. It resprouts right back. And it was probably fire that kept it so dominant in some areas because it could aggressively re-sprout following top kill more so than other species. Giant cane is going to be very easy to identify. Um, it can get up to 30 feet tall, although typically you'll see it 10 feet tall or less. Uh, its stems can get up to 3 inches in diameter, although typically it's going to be 3 quarters of an inch or less in diameter how you typically see it. And it's a grass, so it's got long strap-like, grass-like leaves. It's perennial, 
it's evergreen and so you always have the leaves you always have the stem should be a real easy identification giant cane can live about 10 years and is a common component of many of our bottomland hardwood forests in the understory or slightly into the midstory. American buckwheat vine is a common vine found in bottomland hardwoods and flooded swampy sites in the U.S. South. Uh, it'll occasionally be found on uplands, but usually near creeks. This vine also goes by red vine as a common name, and you may also hear it called ladies' eardrops, and we'll get to why in a moment. The scientific name is Polygonaceae brunichia ovata. In terms of identification, this photo shows several key features. One, the leaves are generally triangular. They have a very truncated leaf base. Sometimes it can be chordate or heart-shaped, but that's going to be a great feature. Two, if you'll notice the leaves here, they're chewed up. It's a little late in the growing season here, but they're kind of a yellowish green. They're not a real dark green. That's a good feature. Finally, if you look at the petioles on a couple of these leaves, you'll notice that they curve sharply. So those curving petioles are another thing that you want to look for. So usually between those three features with the leaves, the fact that you're on a bottomland site, it's an easy vine to ID. Even like this leaf that's more chordate at the base, it still has that general triangular shape. Now it's called Lady's Eardrop because of the fruit. It's got an akeen, but these fruits kind of resemble uh, earrings that hang down, and so that has given it that common name. They'll be on there in the fall. Here's a shot where they're pretty fresh. They dry out like it seen here, but they're in these dense clusters. You're in a wet area. It makes this vine very easy to identify. Uh, this vine does climb by tendrils, and you see the woody stem here. Some people will describe it as semi-woody. Generally, you'll see it when it's pretty small. It's pretty herbaceous. Uh, but it will go woody later, and the tendrils even go woody eventually. And in terms of form, this thing looks like an invasive species. It's not. It's a native species, but it can really get aggressive and grow over all sorts of different vegetation. So again, bottom lands, swamps, creeks, that's where you're looking for American buckwheat vine. Use the shape of the leaf. Use the petiole. Use the fruits if you can. Hawthorns are in the rose family, the rosaceae. The genus is Crataegus. We're going to learn them as a group first, and then we'll learn one specific species of hawthorn. There's about 40 species of hawthorns native to East Texas, which is why we're going over it more generally. Um, there's about a 1960 book from Robert Vines uh, that has a good description of all the hawthorn species of East Texas. With hawthorns, they're small trees, and their most common use is as an ornamental. They're native, and so they're also popular uh, for wildlife. People like eating the fruit, so that's going to be their main uses. In terms of identification, the bark will remind you of crepe myrtles, where it's red-colored, tan-colored, brown-colored, green-colored, all mixed together, shreddy, peely, camouflage-like. Occasionally, I'll have students come out of the woods and tell me they saw crepe myrtles in the middle of the woods, and invariably what they ended up seeing was a hawthorn. Hawthorns do have thorns, and they can be pretty aggressive at times, so you do need to watch out for that. And the buds on them are going to be pretty distinct, too. You can see in the center of this photo here, they are red. They are globose or round. And that's what's going to distinguish them from other similar species like honey locust, where they'll also have red thorns. But if you don't have leaves, honey locust, the buds are very indistinct. They're hard to notice, but you have this nice round spherical bud on the hawthorns. The leaves are going to be variable in shape and lobing. Uh, they will generally have serrated margins. So here you see sort of a cuneate shaped leaf, roughly triangular. Here you see a much more rounded leaf, uh, nice and dark shiny green on top. Here you see one that's three lobed Shape more like a maple, but again, still look for that serrated margin. Look for the other features we've talked about. The hawthorns have showy flowers, another reason that they're popular as ornamentals. And they have small poems. Think of a poem as an apple. This is just much smaller. It's going to be about the size of most cherries. And so some species like mayhaw are very popular. People will pick them, uh, make them into jellies, jams, things like that. 
but these are also great soft mass producing trees for wildlife. So here you see one more fruit, and there's the overall form of one planted in a landscape. So popular ornamental tree, native all over the eastern United States, good wildlife tree, and those are your hawthorns in general, Rosaceae critigus SPP. This is another episode of Woodworking with me, a Rackman person. Today we'll be using these fine power tools on this wood. We gotta clamp our wood. Here our wood is clamped. We're going to use this drill. Whee! Now we have to cut our wood with this reciprocal cutting saw. Cut, cut, oops. Cut, oops. Okay, that's not going to work. Time to use a jigsaw. Cut, cut, cut with this jigsaw. There we go. Now we have to fix the edge of our wood. We'll use this router. Drop the edge, drop the edge, drop the edge. Now we gotta cut it again, but at a different angle. Let's use this circular saw. Oops, a daisy. Now it's time to put the PPE back on. And here we cut with the circular saw. Our wood's not smooth though, so let's sand it. Sand, 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 sand. And here's our wood. Looks good, doesn't it? That is all. So we just learned the hawthorns generically. There's only one hawthorn we'll learn to species, and that's parsley hawthorn, Rosaceae crataegus marshallii. We're learning parsley hawthorn to species for two reasons. One, it's fairly common in East Texas, and two, it's very easy to identify based on this parsley appearing leaf. So everything else we've told you about hawthorns applies to parsley hawthorn. Really the distinguishing feature is the leaf. We'll handle this on quizzes the same way we're handling blueberry and tree sparkleberry, where any blueberry other than tree sparkleberry you can identify as Vaccinium SPP and earn full credit, whereas if it's tree sparkleberry, you'll need to put Vaccinium arboreum. When you look at the leaves of parsley hawthorn, they vary a little bit in the lobing, they have serrated margins, but it's generally reminiscent of parsley. The fall color will be yellow, pretty obvious, so that makes it a good ornamental like the other hawthorns. Same thorns, same globose red buds, same small homes that have good value for both people and wildlife. So now we know parsley hawthorn to species, Crataegus marshallii. If you are taking dendro and there are no leaves on a hawthorn, we'll just go with Crataegus spp. Uh, in order to tell this as a separate species, we're only going to focus on that when there's leaves available for you to look at. So if you see a leaf that looks anything other than this parsley shape, Crataegus spp hawthorn. When you see these, parsley hawthorn, Crataegus marshallii. Trifoliate orange, also sometimes known as hardy orange, is an invasive species from East Texas, north to Missouri, east to the Atlantic, and further east it makes it as far north as Pennsylvania. Uh, some citrus growers and gardeners are still planting this. Uh, in the case of citrus, they may use it as root stock for other species to graft on top of it. Uh, in terms of gardeners, they'll plant it as a hedge or shrub, and uh, people will consume the fruits on it, make marmalade, stuff like that out of it. Uh, but it really is an invasive species that ideally would not be planted. Uh, you see trifoliate orange hyphenated here. It's not in the citrus genus, although it is in the same family. So it's closely related to other citrus, but not quite. It's called hardy orange because it can survive further north than the other citrus species. In terms of identification, the green twigs with nasty, aggressive thorns are going to be one of your best features. Sometimes these dark green stems are flattened, leading right into the thorns. And so summer, winter, whenever, that's going to be an easy way to identify it. The stem will stay green until it gets larger in diameter, going a little more woody, a little more brown in color. And the form on this thing, I don't have a good form photo, but it's going to form a brambling thicket that can reach 30 feet in height. If you have to walk through a patch of this, it will tear you to pieces. Uh, it's typically much better when timber cruising to find a way to go around if you run into a thick patch 
of hardy orange. Now it's Ponsiris trifoliata. Trifoliata is referring to these trifoliate leaves. And the petiole even has uh, a wing on it, so it's kind of got a little bit of leaf on the petiole there. Very easy to identify it. It looks like a clover or a cross or something like that. Here's the back of the leaf, a little bit lighter in color, but similar. And they'll get pretty dense foliage on them during the growing season. Uh, they're known for the fruits. Uh, it does resemble a small orange, a tangerine, a cutie, something like that. Technically, it's a berry low. It is not a Hesperidium, which is what the true oranges are. Um, if you get it during the wrong time of year, it doesn't taste too good. But if you get it during the right time of year, uh, it, it is edible. So that's trifoliate orange. Uh, it is being planted. Uh, it is invasive. Hopefully, people quit planting it so much. Our next tree is Eastern Cottonwood, Salicaceae Populus deltoides. Uh, it is a poplar. The Salicaceae family is the willow family. Uh, so we've already learned yellow poplar, which wasn't a poplar. It's in the magnolia family. And here we're learning a true poplar, but we're calling it cottonwood. So the, the names are a little bit confusing. Eastern cottonwood is one of the tallest trees east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, heights of 175 to 190 feet have been observed. Uh, it can reach four to six feet in diameter at breast height, four and a half feet off the ground. So it's an absolutely enormous tree. It's very fast growing. In rare instances in well-managed stands planted with high-performing clones, it's reached 40 feet in height in three years for some of the biggest trees in the stand and 100 feet tall in nine years. So those are exceptional growth rates. That's certainly not normal, uh, but it is a rapidly growing eastern tree. Identification is going to be very easy for eastern cottonwood. Uh, it has triangular leaves. Uh, they'll have serrations on the margin. The further west you go in the native range, the more serrations you get on the margin. Nice acuminate tip. It's called Populus deltoides, deltoid meaning triangular, because of these triangular leaves. Often I'll first notice cottonwood walking through the woods when I look on the ground and see the leaves that have fallen off the tree. They always seem to be a very specific color of gray that tends to stand out from other leaves that have fallen on the forest floor. Um, beyond the triangular shape of the leaves, another interesting feature of this tree, as well as many members of the populous genus, like trembling aspen, uh, is the flattened petiole. If you grab a petiole, it won't roll in your fingers because it is flattened. And that makes the leaves flutter a little bit more up in the tree. Uh, here you see the bark on a really large eastern cottonwood. Despite them getting this large, they really aren't very long-lived. They, they tend to be younger trees like many members of the poplars. They're early successional, shade intolerant. So they grow rapidly early, but then they tend to fall apart as they get older. Because of their rapid growth, the wood also, it's used for pulpwood or... Uh, you know, it's not used directly for flooring, furniture, anything like that. Uh, primarily grown for pulp. Here you see the bark on a smaller stem. And when we look at this bark, uh, you'll see you could confuse it with sweet gum, maybe, or black gum, or, you know, a few of the oaks, maybe. Uh, but really what you notice is these ridges running up and down an eastern cottonwood. And they will be noticeably grayer in color than many other trees. Eastern cottonwood is dioecious, uh, and you see here one of the flowers, one of the female flowers on the tree. Um, it'll produce uh, capsules which open and, and release lots of very cottony fibered seed that is wind dispersed. Um, they'll seed in only on bare mineral soil, and they usually need sandy to maybe silty textures. But this is your classic river bar species, where it'll grow on a bar or a levee, uh, naturally formed by sedimentation during flooding that's right by the stream. So small seeded, bare mineral soil, and it really grows right by water, often in pure stands. Uh, here's the twig. Uh, the buds will be sticky like many members of the populace genus a little bit. Uh, but really the cool thing about the twigs, usually you don't buy eastern cottonwood seedlings from a nursery. You can't plant it as a seedling because the nursery doesn't sell them that way because they would have to get all these little tiny seeds and try to germinate them. It's a real hassle. 
But Eastern Cottonwood is interesting, along with Black Willow in the same family, in that you can just take a stick, stick it in the ground, and if that stick was alive and in good shape, a twig, a fresh twig, it will root. So they use rooted cuttings here to propagate cottonwood. Um, I've even seen examples where planters have put them in the ground upside down, and it still grows into a small tree. Not the best form tree. You can tell something's off, but it, it'll still grow into a tree. So usually these are planted as cuttings. Um, here you see the form on one from far away. That's not the best form for cottonwood. Often it will have one main stem. You can see this tree is forked. Uh, but you can see that they tend to go into decline pretty early in their life. They start falling apart. Uh, Eastern cottonwood is native from East Texas, Central Texas, all the way north up into Canada, parts of the Lake States, east all the way to the Atlantic Ocean and the Carolinas. Um, doesn't make it quite into New England, but it's a very broadly distributed, very rapidly growing eastern tree. This is another episode of Woodworking with me, a Rackhead person. Today we'll be using all these fine hand tools. We'll use them on this piece of wood. Let's start with this hammer, which we'll use with this nail. Here's how we bang the nail in. Hammer, hammer, hammer. Next up, we need to cut our wood. But before we cut, we have to measure. Here's the tape measure. Let's measure the wood. Now we measure the wood. Now we get the saw. This is a nice hand saw. Then we're going to saw the wood. When we're all the way through sawing the wood, the wood falls off. Next up, we need to plane our piece. This is a nice plane. We'll plane, plane, plane our wood. And then it's pretty smooth. But not smooth enough. We need sandpaper. Here we sand, sand, sand the wood. That is all. Black willow is one of only two willows we'll learn this semester, and it's the only native willow we're learning. Um, of the eastern willows, it is by far the largest. It's one of the few that attains tree-like stature across its entire range. Uh, and it is in the Salicaceae family with the other willows, Salix nigra. Uh, black willow is named black willow because of the dark color of its bark, which you can see even in this photo. Um, this is a good example of the sort of site you would expect black willow to grow on. Looking at this photo, you see it germinating right out of sand beside a reservoir. Uh, it's very small seeded like uh, cottonwood that we just discussed, and so its seed needs to fall on bare mineral soil, typically um, exposed by overland flooding. Black willow, as this photo also demonstrates, also has relatively poor form, typically. Not always, but typically. Here are the leaves on black willow. You can see why willow oak was named willow oak, since we've already learned it. Uh, the leaves are long, linear, very narrow. They curve and have slight serrations on the margin. So they're pretty obvious leaves. Here they are again. Nothing else with a leaf quite this long or quite this narrow that we're learning this semester. Uh, it is deciduous, but you can ID it off the twigs just as well. Here's a small twig, not very descript. But if you think you have a willow, what you want to do is take down a live twig like this and you want to chew on it. And you'll really recognize the taste at first. You'll be racking your brain trying to see what it is. And then you'll realize if you've ever chewed up an aspirin tablet or had a powdered aspirin product like BC powders, uh, it's the same taste. And you're, in fact, tasting the same chemical. Salicylic acid is a natural compound found in willows. And people have used it for a long time for everything we use aspirin for today to alleviate pain and swelling. Uh, so I don't know what the dosage is, how many twigs it is per pill, but willow is used medicinally for that purpose. Here you see a slightly better picture of the twig up a little bit closer. And what you want to focus on with the buds is that the buds are oppressed right up to the twig. So the buds are kind of stuck to the side of the twig. Often on the trunk of a black willow, you'll see a bunch of limbs and branches and twigs sticking right out of it. They tend to be poorly formed. So even on a big one, you can often get a twig down pretty low. In areas where they're growing well, 
Uh, the bark peels in vertical strips. It's rough, irregular, generally dark in color. Here's the form on uh, a few of them overhanging uh, a watercourse there. And so you can see the, the limbs also are another good ID feature. They hang down. You can almost imagine pulling one of these long, slender twigs off a of black willow and being able to tie it in a knot or make rope out of it. So they're very long, ropey, flexible twigs. Uh, with black willow, it did have some historic timber value. It has very lightweight yet strong wood that's straight grained and easy to shape. And so historically, it was used for prosthetic limbs uh, before we started using metals and plastics and all the things that we use today. Uh, the wood is still in use today. Pulp wood's a big use, but it's also used for pallets, crates, uh, and other specialty products. Uh, here you see willow growing in a pure stand, as it does sometimes in the lower Mississippi alluvial valley. Uh, and in stands like this, it can produce decent timber. Uh, as I discussed with eastern cottonwood, this is reproduced by cuttings. So you just stick a stick in the ground. As I discussed with cottonwood, it's very intolerant of shade, doesn't react well to other competing species, and it's reproduced by cuttings. So you don't plant willow seedlings, you plant willow cuttings. Uh, for that reason, historically, it was favored to reforest wetland areas uh, following excessive extractive logging. Uh, so it's been used from a restoration standpoint a lot. Modern usage is probably primarily focused on pulp wood, uh, where it is managed. It's really only going to grow on sites where the water table is high and the soils are moist even in the summer. It's not going to grow on sites that dry out completely in the summer. So sites where black willow grows well, probably difficult to log most of the year. Black willow is very broadly distributed. It grows from central Texas east to the Atlantic Ocean, north into New England and the Lake States. So it basically covers the entire eastern United States. Common sweetleaf is a shrub or small tree native to most of the U.S. southern coastal plain. Uh, it's not found in the area right by the Mississippi River, uh, but most of the rest of the coastal plain is covered. Sweetleaf is native. It's not super common, but it's definitely out there, and you'll find it on more mesic sites. Um, as a tree, it's generally 4 inches or less in DBH. 10, 20 feet tall is going to be typical. You'll often see them as shrubs between knee and shoulder height as well. While they are deciduous, in some parts of the range here in East Texas, it seems like they're evergreen. I almost never see them without leaves. Uh, but the cool thing about them, another common name for them is horse sugar. And they're called that because during some times in the year, you can take the leaf when they've been photosynthesizing well, fold it up a few times, find a clean leaf first. You don't want bird poop or anything. Uh, chew it between your incisors. You're not trying to swallow the leaf or anything like that. Uh, but you'll notice it's real sugary. It's very sweet, which is why it's called sweet leaf. Uh, the scientific name on it is Simplocasei simplocos tinctoria. So here you see a pretty typical photo of trees ranging between about 5 and 10 feet in height. And this is what the shrubs will look like, where they're 2, 3 feet in height. Usually you'll notice it in mesic areas pretty close to water. So that's going to be where you would expect it to be found. Uh, the leaves have slightly irregular margins, maybe slight serrations, but they're noticeably evergreen looking with yellow petioles, yellow midrib. Uh, I don't have a photo of the back of the leaf, but that's going to be kind of yellowish as well. Plus you can use the taste test. Uh, here's a few other examples of the leaves, and all these examples I'm showing you, uh, they're pretty glabrous. They don't have any tomentum or fur on them. I have seen sweet leaf over in the Carolinas uh, having dense tomentum on the leaves during some times of the year. So if you ever find one, it's got dense fuzz on it, but it still has that really sweet taste to the leaf, it's probably still a sweet leaf. If you're trying to identify sweet leaf, it's helpful to get a twig. And when you look at the twigs, what you want to do is whittle into them. And as you can see here, the pith is chambered. They have uh, flowers in about May over much of their range. And then those flowers, they'll be a little bit fragrant, pretty small. Uh, they'll go to kind of a brownish colored droop, about half an inch in diameter, a little bit of wildlife value. Uh, not a ton of uses for sweet leaf. It's just a native small tree or shrub we've got on our landscape. 
Uh, historically, it was used to some extent uh, for a yellow dye. Our final species here in week nine is cedar elm. Cedar elm is Ulmaceae ulmus crassifolia, and it's exclusively a West Gulf elm. It's found in a little bit of western Mississippi. It's found in much of Louisiana. It's found in Arkansas, a little bit of Oklahoma, but the vast majority of its range is covering almost all of these Texas piney woods, central Texas, south Texas, even into northeastern Mexico. Uh, so this is a pretty important elm in Texas. Compared to our other elms, uh, it's generally smaller, reaching about 100 feet in height. Less than that would be typical. In some parts of its range, it'll only reach 20 feet in height. And at max, it hits about 3 foot dBH, but typically it's going to be a lot smaller than that. To identify cedar elm, one of the first things you want to do is look at the bark. And this is one reason it's called cedar elm. This bark peels vertically and resembles a species like eastern red cedar. Now when we say cedar in the eastern U.S., we're really talking about junipers. Eastern red cedar is in fact Juniperus virginiana. So juniper elm really would have been a better name, but we call all our junipers here cedar too, so more confusion with common names. When looking at the leaves, the most notable feature is that they're small. They're almost similar in size to Chinese elm, which we'll learn here in a few weeks. Uh, but they're easily half to a third the size of winged elm, which has our next smallest leaf. They can be the size of some of the smaller leaves you'd expect to see on planar tree. Uh, the leaves are lighter colored on the back, otherwise they're pretty typical for elm leaves. The twigs sometimes will be winged, like almost a lot of winged elm. However, the wings compared to winged elm are more slender, more delicate, and they're not winged as much, nearly to the same extent that almost a lot of is. Uh, so here's an example of a zigzag typical brown elm twig uh, on a cedar elm that has no wings on it. The second reason this species is called cedar elm and is comparable to our junipers is that it really likes limestone-derived soils. Uh, that's a similarity between the two groups of species, and it explains why you find it so abundantly in our mesic and hydric areas of central and south Texas, where you do start getting a lot more limestone-derived soils with high calcium levels. Uh, there's one final feature I'd like to note for cedar elm that's kind of interesting morphologically. Uh, it flowers and fruits in the fall. It's one of our only native elms to do that. Uh, almost all the others flower and fruit in the spring. Uh, and you won't be surprised to see the small wafer or coin-like samaras, smaller than a dime, uh, on the trees in late September, October, or November. Cedar elm has some timber value. It's thrown in with other hard elms like American elm. Um, and of course, it'll be used for that in East Texas, in Louisiana, and Arkansas. But over much of Central Texas and much of South Texas, you just don't have much in the way of mills that are taking forest products. Uh, there are open woodlands there more than forest. And so over much of its range, it really doesn't have much value from a timber standpoint. Some birds will eat the Samaras, so it's got some wildlife value. Uh, and it's going to be a pretty important riparian species over a pretty broad range in the western Gulf Forest. Hey there again, it's me, a raccoon person. Thanks for spending your day woodworking with me. I know you're probably busy studying your trees and all. Woodworking is an extremely satisfying hobby. I bet you want to find out what we did with all that wood. What did we make? Well, here it is. Thank you, arachnid person, for your fine handiwork and precision woodworking. I'll take this tree heart and I'll hang it on my wall.
like you have overlooked the most important question. Is that one eyebrow or two? Dad, stop taking pictures of those trees. Bad, bad.